Hi, everybody. Welcome to Conversations with Calvin, We the Species. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's Wednesday. I'm looking at my thing here. It's July 12th. So this is where we're alive. Uh, and uh, I've been anticipating this for a long time for a, a whole slew of reasons. I'm with Jack Rasmussen, uh, a senior at USC, which has nothing to do with you, but it is one of my favorite schools. And I used to tease my son all, all the time. He cannot when he was in high school, he cannot go to USC because it's too far from New Jersey. Uh, it, 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 it's just a great school, and, and I had a friend who played b-ball there a long time ago. But anyway, I've been really anticipating this. Uh, Jack's resume as a senior in, in college uh, is beyond, and we're going to kind of, uh, we'll kind of dissect and, and talk about so many different aspects to you as a senior. Um, so I've said enough, this is my, this has been my official um, Johnny Carson. Do you remember him, Jack, Johnny Carson? Yeah, I, I remember Johnny, Good. yeah. Good, because uh, I mentioned to a lot of Gen Z's, Johnny Carson and people know what <laughs> about. Uh, but he's uh, always been a hero of mine uh, and I tried to study him as, as an interviewer. Uh, so, Without further ado, uh, to introduce Jack Rasmussen, if you want to uh, jump in and do a little quick bio, and then we're going to start to jump into stuff. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Calvin. I really appreciate it. I was really looking forward to this too, so thank you for welcoming me. I am a senior, like you said, at uh, USC in Los Angeles. I study business administration. I minor in cinematic arts and sports media industries, and I was born and raised in Los Gatos, California, which is a small town in the Bay Area, in the South Bay, about an hour south of San Francisco. So I grew up, I love sports. I grew up a 49er fan, Giants fan, played a bunch of sports, always wanted to go to a big sports school, but also have, you know, the ability to pursue my my academic um pursuit. So I uh, picked USC and it's been a, a great experience so far. I can't complain. Um, I love it in California. So uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Great. Uh, I should mention to the audience, uh, I just asked you, uh, it's three o'clock here in Jersey and it's noontime out there in California, but I was curious about the temperature and, and Jack lamented he said well it's been kind of warm lately but it's a little cool today it's in the 60s as as we just climbed out of the 30s uh, here it is what it is um so um you've got three different uh courses of studies that you're pursuing at ucs at usc uh business ads cinematic arts and sports media so talk a little bit about each course of study that you're doing they're so diverse by the way i mean Kind of, but then kind of not diverse. But Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, growing up, I always had a very creative side to me. I won awards in um, the art shows. I loved drawing and I also loved movies. So that was something that I knew I wanted to pursue in my career. I just didn't really know when it would kind of come up. And because USC has such great schools in the arts, specifically the cinema school is the best in the country and also the, the journalism school is the best in the country. So uh, it, it was kind of a no brainer for me to, to study in both of those schools because why not? Because I have the opportunity to. So I chose Annenberg, the School of Journalism at USC and when trying to think of what exact minor I wanted to choose, I've always had an interest in sports. So sports media was sort of, it just came to me. And so I chose that and I've had the privilege of taking some really cool courses. Um, this semester, I'm actually taking a very interesting course called the Athlete Sports Media and Popular Culture. And that's with um, a professor who I really love his name's Jeffrey Fellinzer. He's worked for the LA Times for a while and he's kind of become a, a great friend and mentor to me. And so that's actually my third class with him. 
um, which is amazing. And then I'm actually taking a, a class with Shelly Smith this semester, who's worked at ESPN for a while. And she's, she's a legend um, for ESPN, one of the best female, I think, um, female workers for ESPN. And she's trailblazed the path there. So I'm actually taking a class called Sports Commentary with her uh, this semester, which I'm really excited about. So just kind of getting exposed to um, some of the greats in the industry and just soaking up as much as I can. And then in terms of cinema, I've been able to take uh, really cool classes too, like screenwriting, um, television symposium, where we get to watch films before they actually get released in the theater. So they're not even released yet and we get to view them and then we get to meet the people behind yeah. the film. So it could be the director or actors. So I've met the director of Queen's Gambit. I've met um, several other directors. Wow. I've also met um, some actors like Zazu, Zazzy Beats um, from Atlanta, which is one of my favorite shows. So um, that's sort of been my creative outlet at USC, uh, those two minors. And then my major is business. Um, I've always sort of been business minded and always been thinking of strategy and what to do next. And I think that just goes hand in hand with sort of my entrepreneurial mindset and trying to make the world a better place in any way that I can. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I love it at USC just because of the broad range of studies that I'm able to take. And it's, I love, I've loved every single class. I, I have yet to take a class mm. where I'm not excited in in some way so yeah i'm super, super grateful yeah i'm listening to you uh two things uh, struck me uh a uh this is a compliment uh I, sometimes i i sit here uh, and i pinch myself from time to time when i'm talking to someone of gen z status and i'm saying to myself how could you be gen z i mean seriously <laughs> You know, uh, it, it, uh, and we'll go through some of the other things you've done. You're so way beyond Gen Z. And and uh, I just had an epiphany listening to you. And the epiphany is, uh, yes, I've always loved USC, but, you know, it's, it's more from, uh, you know, it's more from a, a sports thing. I, I remember when USC played uh, Alabama way back, and, and it was the first time that Alabama played uh, a school with African Americans, and and mm. they had Bear Bryant, and and that was the beginning uh, of of the end of segregation in in Alabama sports, but it was USC uh, because USC represented. But I'm listening to you, uh, and and the course offerings and the professors, and the the infiltration of Hollywood. And uh, all of that, uh, it's a magical place. Uh, it is to be part of that. So it's great stuff. So moving on, uh, uh, and, and I, this is not in any kind of Jack Russ Mustin chronological order, but you're in the, you're in the <laughs> finishing touches of writing a, a book that uh, fascinates me. Uh, and, and I really look forward to reading it because I'm, I, I like to go out to eat. Uh, as we all do, but you you are the author of Fine Dining: The Secrets Behind the Restaurant Industry, and and you can tell us when it's due out. You're in the final manuscript stages. So, how does a college senior uh, get into that? Where did this come from? <laughs> That's a great question. I uh, I'm very well connected to uh, people through LinkedIn and. Uh, kind of an advertisement came came to me and it was uh, I think it was Eric Coaster who's a entrepreneurship professor at Georgetown University and I'm super into entrepreneurship and we'll get into that but he uh, it caught my eye and he has this program called the creators the creators program where he helps people who are very creative and want to create things specifically books he helps them create what they envision and so I just called him one day and I was like hey I have this idea I really want to kind of write a book about my love for food but also kind of 
all the entrepreneurship things that I'm learning and sort of marry it together in this really cool way. Um, and he was like, let's like, I'll help you do it. Join my, join our author community. So I, uh, that call was actually in the spring of 2021, I think last year. Wow. And so I started writing during the summer and I was working for Wells Fargo too, at the time um, on wall street, kind of remotely in on the West coast, which was, which is another crazy story. But so I was writing during the nights and I would work during the day. And basically I, my whole life, I've had this very high respect for food and like my parents know it. My brother knows it, that I just, I really appreciate what I eat. And I also appreciate restaurants at a whole nother level. Um, and, and my friends know this, like my surprise birthday parties are always at restaurants. They'll, they'll surprise me at a restaurant because I love food and I love, I just love the community as aspect of it. So I wanted to write something that showed respect for restaurants and how much time and commitment is put in by the owners and the chefs and the workers, because there's so many different aspects that people don't know. And so I studied the restaurant industry for a little bit and I went to some restaurants that I really love. I started in my hometown in Los Gatos and I interviewed the owner of Wine Cellar, which is our favorite restaurant. And it's, it's a staple here in, in Los Gatos where I'm from. And I interviewed her and the interview went really well. It was almost two hours long. And so I was like, wow, okay, I could, like I should keep doing this because I, I learned so much from her. So I interviewed some chefs in Chicago, in New York, and some more here in the Bay Area. And then the book just started to come together. And uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm so excited. It'll be out in May um, on Amazon. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited for that to be out. Uh, and I'm excited to read it. Uh, like I said, I, I, um, we just, there's nothing like going out to eat and, and, mm -hmm. and, and it, it's a whole wonderful world. Um, and, and I also told you before we went on air that when it comes out, you'll come back and we'll talk all about it. And, uh, and the final, uh, I, I have this great, uh, simpatico with you because, uh, I, I just finished my second novel. And, and I'm going through yeah. the editing process. So uh, great identification. It's a brotherhood or a sisterhood or whatever kind of hood you want to call it when you finish a book. Uh, Norman Mailer said, uh, uh, the great American writer said, for a guy writing a, a book, it's equivalent to giving birth. <laughs> so you can digest that, Jack. Yeah. It's a great, uh, he said, I read that a long, long time ago in, in, in a you know, you watch this thing grow and finally giving birth the day it gets published. So anyway, uh, so moving on, uh, I don't know a lot about this aspect. Uh, I've done my research, but uh, you, you do a lot of work with Screen 360 TV. Mm -hmm. uh, you've done a lot of work with that. What is it? <laughs> How did yeah. you get to that? Yeah, so I took a few classes at Stanford University in the summer of 2020. And I originally got in because, as you mentioned, I think I have a strong interest in mental health awareness and mental health issues. So I was doing research on mental health, specifically how I could help mental health patients with dementia and um, through, through puzzles specifically so I was doing research on that and how I could help help them remember things and so I got admitted into the Silicon Valley Innovation Academy which is a program for summer students at Stanford to take and study together and um, I was so excited for that but then COVID hit so I didn't end up getting to do that and instead I took a few entrepreneurship classes so I met um, a lady named Katie Cavanaugh there, and she's a graduate student from the education school. 
at Stanford and she had this company called Screen360 TV that uses um, foreign films to teach cultural literacy to students K through 12 in the United States and abroad. So we're basically connecting peers in different classrooms through uh, movies that they watch a movie together and then they discuss it afterwards. And a lot of times we, we bring on the director. Wow. So, so it's just, it's so cool um, because I wasn't really exposed to many film festivals growing up. And she's created uh, five uh, children's film festivals in the US. She's, she's created, actually, I think most of them that have been created in the US. So it, it was just so cool when I met her and she really wanted me to help her in her mission. So I've been working with her for almost two years now. And I uh, teach, I teach students, I work with students and try to lead discussions. Um, the biggest one we had was last August um, and it was with a classroom in India. And I got to lead, we did breakout rooms and me and her, we each led about uh, 20 students. So I led the discussion uh, with some students in India, which was just such a really empowering experience because a lot of them are very wise beyond their years. And uh, it was just, it was super cool to, to see all the critical thinking that they could do. Wow. Um, yeah, so it, that's been an amazing opportunity for me to see to watch films that I never would have really been exposed to and see how they can impact people. Uh, it's been a really amazing experience and we're, we're still trying to raise more money. We've gotten, we've raised 250,000 and um, we've kind of just been in this stage where we're trying to grow, but we don't really know. So we um, we're working with it with a technical guy right now to sort of, uh, evolve our our technical side of things um but yeah it's it's been really fun wow well, that's just a wow um, when we go off here i want to we'll talk more about that briefly I'm yeah made, i'm taking notes even as i'm talking to you i'm taking notes you know you never get away from taking notes uh even though i graduated a half century ago uh, <laughs> you never uh, um, anyway uh Moving on, uh, in, in such an interesting life, you've done some modeling. I have. How yeah. and when and where and why? <laughs> um, I've always been, uh, I've just always thought that taking pictures has always been an interesting thing. And I think um, I do want to get more into like expressive things when I when I graduate, such as like maybe you know, the movie industry. And um, when I was in uh, high school is when it first kind of started. And that's when um, the admissions team asked me to be sort of like the poster child for our school. And I was like, okay, I, I didn't really know what to think of it. So basically that's when I, I keep, they took pictures of me and stuff like that. And I never had really done stuff like that besides school portraits so it was it was an interesting experience like trying on different clothes and having them take my picture so that's kind of where it started uh being an ambassador for my high school and then when I went to college at USC it's kind of the same thing I'm a ambassador for the business school so I've done modeling for them and I've also done uh, some modeling for different brands, um, and most recently, uh, Boohoo Man, which is a, a UK clothing brand, oh. asked, asked me to do modeling for them. So oh. I've been doing modeling for them for a while, and uh, it's been super fun because I, yeah, I just love the idea of, because uh, there's a background that you need to decide on, and it, it's sort of like a movie where you're directing a scene. Yeah. And so um, it's fun because they've, they've given me autonomy to, you know, decide what I want to wear and uh, what outfits that I want to kind of um, show off. And then also I, I decide where I want to be. So it's, it's sort of like directing a little bit. Great. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I, it's been a fun experience. 
that's that's great. They give you the latitude and plenitude uh, to do yeah. that kind of stuff. I did mention to you last time we, we chatted that I, I modeled for an, an art class when I was your age. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a one shot deal. I wasn't put on this earth to, to model for an art <laughs> class. But anyway, enough with that. I, I did notice uh, off topic. Uh, you have an interesting. You know, I have my little things on. You have a no gas, no break. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what does that mean? I'm guessing it's something environmental. <laughs> no, it's uh, so actually well, it it means a lot to me. Um, so the this summer I actually got the opportunity to meet um, someone who was a huge supporter of me. Um, he is a football coach. Uh, his name is, is Greg Knapp. He actually unfortunately passed away, but he, um, last year he passed away. So it was like, I, I we were just getting uh, closer and he was one of the nicest people I'd, I'd ever met. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, he, he would text me the nicest things, but he was a football coach for the Jets and he won. Wow. A Super Bowl. He won a Super Bowl with Peyton Manning. So he was a quarterback coach. Um, he was Peyton's quarterback coach when he wow. won the Super Bowl with the Broncos. And so that was his saying. That was uh, Greg's saying in the mm -hmm. huddle was he would say, all gas, no break. And uh, so anyway, I met him uh, last year in January. And I actually watched the Super Bowl with him last year. Uh and he let me try on his Super Bowl ring and everything. And so he, uh, this is from him, this bracelet. And uh, it just, it means a lot to me. And for me, it means um, you're, you're always going to face obstacles in your, in your life. And a lot of the times when you don't really expect it. And I think just being strong and, and being yourself and pushing through it is so important. Uh, so yeah, that that brace that reminds me of him, but it yeah, it's just a great um, great reminder that you're you're always gonna face adversity, but just keep keep pushing because it'll always get better. I've had this on. I, I wear this. I've had it on for forty or fifty years on my wrist. Uh, I mean, I get new ones because they kind of wear yeah. out. But when people ask me why, it, it, it's, it's just a combination of things. You know, sometimes I need to snap out of it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, there, was a great, uh, there was a great scene in a movie with Nicolas Cage and, and Cher called Moonstruck when she slaps him in the face. One of the great scenes in all of motion picture history, I think. She slaps him in the face and she says, snap out of it. So I don't, sometimes when I want to snap out of it, I gently slap myself but, or I, I do my thing here. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> moving on. I, this, I, you know, there's so much here to you. Um, you. You put together an interview with child psychologists and high school teachers and filmmakers. Uh, what was that uh, about? Uh, I, yeah, that was for, that was for Screen 360 and that okay. was Okay. That was for, um, so Katie was having a lot of troubles trying to find product market fit. And I, I told her that I think the best option for us uh, at the moment is to focus on AP and IB curriculum in high school classrooms. Um, but I wanted to interview people to find out what they would what they think and what they um, think children need. And so I interviewed a child psychologist and I asked him, uh, do you think that foreign films have a place in the classroom? And is it, do you think it's a relevant thing? Do you think that we should be pursuing this? And he said that he thinks films are a great vehicle to capture capture students attention especially at that age um but i think it is hard to consistently play movies in the classroom because you you can't just be watching movies so it that was an interesting conversation but um also interviewing my past high school teachers was really uh was a really interesting experience because they 
said that every year what's really hard for them is trying to find curriculum because they have to they have to find curriculum they have to write all the curriculum and there's so many worksheets that they have to do so finding curriculum that's already set for them is like it's amazing it's like finding gold so they were really interested in the fact that we could show a movie and then we could have a a uh, survey and a worksheet afterward because then they don't have to worry about it we just come in and we handle the whole class so that was something where we were like oh okay maybe we have something on our hands here and that's when we uh we went ahead and piloted at my high school which is archbishop midi high school in in san jose california and we piloted in three classrooms which was really exciting uh because i I just graduated in 2018 and it, we were piloting in 2020. So it was like, it was literally two, <laughs> two years after two I graduated. Years, yeah. So my teachers, my, it was funny because I was running classes and my teachers were like, well, who, who, are, who is this guy? He's crazy. But um, yeah, it was, it was a really fun experience. And a lot of the students responded really well to what we were presenting, which was really cool to see um so yeah that that's why i did that um and i just i do love interviewing people in general and i've had the the pleasure of doing that uh through some clubs i'm at I, I, i'm in it at usc uh so that that's been a cool opportunity interviewing uh, uh, and, and i'm relatively new to it i mean i'm i you know i didn't grow up to interviewing this is all uh this whole stage in my life is relatively new, but uh, interviewing is great and, and it's a skill and it, it grows. And I was paid a, a super compliment last night because uh, I interviewed this former Rutgers basketball player uh, who's great. He came to Rutgers as a, uh, in, through the transfer portal. He played his senior year at Rutgers and he was, he was great, a quasi a boa. And then he went off to France and, and um, I actually mentored him in, in LinkedIn and networking and stuff. We met and I mentored him and, and, and I interviewed him a few weeks ago, right around Christmas. He's, he's playing for the number two league in, in France and he's the leading scorer. It's great. Uh, so we had a, a 40 minute interview and, and then I passed it along to, to, um, to the guys on, on the Rutgers basketball message board. I don't go there because I don't go there. I don't mess around with message boards, but I passed the one. But anyway, somebody watched the, the video and, and they said, Calvin has uh, this hints of Larry, uh, Larry King. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was like, wow, uh, what a nice thing. I didn't know who the guy was who said it. You know, everybody's got a, a, you know, a trade name. So um, we're just going to go off topic for a quick second uh as we kind of finish things uh this is one of my favorite questions and you can uh use it someday if you want i have no problem with that uh so here's the question jack uh excluding a family or friends somebody living or dead you'd like to spend a day with oh and that i mean and you can it could be a few people whatever hey whatever whatever works it's fine that's such a good question. It is a good question. It is. That, that's very hard to choose one because there's so many industries that I'm like really interested in. But I would probably say right off the top of my head, probably Kobe Bryant, um, just because I we have the same birthday. So I've always felt connected to him in some way. And I think he is one of the obviously he's one of the greatest of all time in the NBA, but just his mentality is something that I, I try to live by in, in my life, like the classic Mamba mentality. Everyone knows, everyone knows it now, but I, I think he worked so hard and he was so disciplined, but he also was so compassionate and such a good family man. Um, so he's, he's always been an example for me. So I, uh, Spending a day with him was great. Really cool. Yeah. And and because you're studying cinematic arts, he won an Academy Award. Exactly. And, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, seriously, who does that? Uh, I mean, yeah. Just his his. Yeah, that's a great answer. 
Okay. How about you? How about you? <laughs> Me? Oh, uh, 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 um, I, I could go down to biblical times uh, uh, if I could. <laughs> Uh, I'm always intrigued. Uh, I'm always intrigued by George Washington. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm intrigued and in, and in, in how these guys got together and, and wrote out uh, a constitution and the Declaration of Independence uh, and and uh, believing in this and that's endured. Uh, it endured really nicely up until last January 6th, uh, but uh it, it has endured and it still continues to endure so he fascinates me but there's a whole uh there's a whole list dr king would be another one that i think about all the time i'm sitting here looking at a picture of albert einstein's eyes over there <laughs> just his eyes that have been behind he fascinates me too because i, I don't comprehend uh i mean i'm relatively intelligent i don't understand how this man in 1900 uh, came up with relativity and, and his grasp of the universe. How does that happen? There's no Google. There's mm-hmm. no internet. How do you do that? There's nothing. There's nothing. And so how does the mind... So th- th- those are just some. Um, anyway, um, moving along, you do a lot of... Anything, you do a lot of... Uh, uh, do a lot. <laughs> uh, you do a lot of activities uh, at USC you know, Teak and uh, anything that stands out. And I know you're, uh, a, is it Warren Bennis? I'm trying, Warren Bennis. Yeah. Uh, which is the same last name as Elaine Bennis from Seinfeld. See, my mind works through association. When I, yeah. uh, so just a quick little picture of what you do at USC. Yeah. So I, I am a Warren Bennis scholar and that program, uh, it does mean a lot to me. And it's uh, named after... Warren Bennis, who actually created the academic field of leadership. It didn't mm-hmm. exist until he, uh, he created it. And he, um, he's quite the academic. He has a lot of degrees. Um, and he taught at uh, Cincinnati, I believe. And mm-hmm. then he taught, he taught in the Ivy League for a while. And then he finally came to USC and taught for a very long time. And then he he passed away. And so they created this program uh, in honor of him. And they choose 20 sophomores at the end of their sophomore year, they choose 20 sophomores at USC out of the whole class to uh, do this leadership cohort together. And so I applied and then I interviewed twice and I got in thankfully. And it's been such a good experience. We've met some incredible people, Wanda Austin, who's the the first ever female and black uh, person to lead the aerospace company. Um, and we've met a lot of other people and it's, yeah, it's been a really, really interesting program. And then this year, our teacher is the Dean of Religious Studies at USC. So that that's gonna be a really interesting uh, experience for me. So yeah, that that program has been amazing, and yeah, I'm I'm also in a fraternity at USC. I'm in Teak, so that's sort of that's kind of my fun outlet um, to meet people and to have fun at USC. Yeah, I I knew that when I got on campus, I I probably join Greek life just because it's a big, it's a classic part of college. So I did that. Um, and then I also was speaking of George Washington and writing, um, <laughs> writing things. I was a senator <laughs> at USC um, during my junior year, so last year. And yeah, I got. I actually wrote a. Um, I wrote a rule that actually got passed, which is um, has to do with food. Uh, funny enough, um, it was the uh, to-go box resolution because there were no to-go boxes in our cafeterias at USC. There was, there's zero. And what I found was that people, sometimes people are rushing or they're going to class and they don't have time to get food or to stop in the dining hall. So why can't we have a compostable box where you can quickly go into the dining hall and get some food 
and then go to your class. And so you can eat it either, you know, after your class or on your way to class. So you don't have to sit down because a lot of the times you can't sit down. So I passed that, which was really oh, cool. exciting. Oh, that's um, really cool. That, I mean, you made a difference. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you then, made a difference. Um, yeah. Too off topic. Well, um, I, I was, I, I, I don't always, uh, but your, your cinematic arts. Uh, did you ever see the movie Animal House? I haven't, no. Okay. With John Belushi. Um, all right. That was just a, a quick question. Because uh, when my son, uh, when my son was eight, and I, I sometimes get in trouble for this, I, I made him watch that movie, and there's some bad language uh, in it. <laughs> when the bad language came up, I coughed. But uh, interestingly, my son is 36 now. He works for Scripps, and and you know, in media. Uh, but one of our bonding uh, elements uh, is uh, that we. Watched Alma House about a hundred times together. Um, and and what about the movie The Graduate? Do you know about I that? Have not, I have not seen that. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, uh, um, there's a, a famous line uh, in the that's with Dustin Hoffman, and, and these are all movies from my generation. You know, oh. it was kind of your age and, and a little older. Uh, these are great historic movies for all kinds of reasons. And one day, if you take the appropriate film course you'll um you'll study those two movies um, i do love dustin hoffman just that was um that was his first movie oh really that was his first movie and and right after that he got signed to do um midnight cowboy which was a powerful Powerful movie. The director, um, I think, it was John Schlesinger, if I'm not mistaken. But Midnight Cowboy with John Boyd, uh, and I think Dustin Hoffman got the Academy Award for that. He did. Powerful, powerful, powerful movie. Uh, and and I actually, uh, well, I was in, I was in college back then, and, and long story. I got a chance to talk to Dustin. He was on a, a TV show, and, and I hung around outside. I went to the TV show, talk show, and, and I talked to him briefly, and, and it was kind of memorable in, in my life. But that's a uh, – and I, I make my son and daughter-in-law watch these kind of movies all the time because I'm an old movie person, and movies yeah. are life. And I was so fascinated when you, 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 were, you were going back and you, you were getting kids to, to watch movies and then to talk about it. And what a way to kind of – bond and, and get kids really into something to show them a movie and because it, it it's life and it makes you think just great stuff okay uh th now one of my favorite topics boy we have to control ourselves because we could talk <laughs> about this our favorite sports college football yes i've always loved college football i it's so funny i i would get so giddy on literally Friday nights, I get so giddy uh, for game day. And game day always starts at 6 a.m. my time. Uh, game day with Lee Corso, Kirk right. Kirby. It's my, it was my, it's my favorite show ever. So I would get so giddy on Friday nights, and I would set my alarm for 5.30, and my parents would think I was crazy. And I'm like, no, I want to watch the full three hours uh, from 6 to 9. And I get up and I'd have, I don't even know if I'd have caffeine at that age, but I'd get up and I'd turn it on and I would just, I would just love it. I listened to everything they said. Then I'd, I'd watch as he put the game day gear on at the end. And I just, I loved it so much. And uh, I grew up a Stanford football fan because both my parents went to Stanford. So I grew up, we went to all the Stanford football bowl games. So I went to the Rose Bowl two years. Wow. They played Iowa, Iowa State, I think. Iowa. And then we lost, or Iowa, 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 not Iowa State. Iowa, and then we lost to Michigan State. I went to that one too. Um, but yeah, we, we uh, were diehard Stanford fans growing up. And so we went to every single one. Uh, to uh, Toby Gerhardt, Andrew Luck. Oh, Richard wow. German. Right. Yeah, I, I watched them right. grow up. Like I watched them play at Stanford. So 
uh, I was always so upset every year that I, I think they got um, cheated out on the Heisman. I think Luck should have won. I think Gerhardt should have won. Um, but that's a whole nother topic. Is yeah, is that the, is a whole nother topic. The Heisman not they, they don't respect the Heisman they don't. They're not respecting the, the uh, Pac-12. <laughs> they don't. Uh, and and that's a, a good segue. Um, yeah, you know, listen, I, I'm I, I'm sure you watched Alabama or Georgia. Uh, mm-hmm. My uh, my takeaway from that. I'm a Rutgers guy, obviously. Um, but my takeaway from that, uh, uh, listen, I, I watched, um, I, I I watched that game intensely, and, and, and my takeaway w- was, you're you listen, you're USC, and I'm Big Ten, and you're you know Pac Ten, Pac Twelve, and uh, uh, my takeaway from that, uh, can we, can we, you know, your conference, yeah. my conference, can we put together a team that can compete with these guys? Um, uh, and, and, and what, what is the future uh, of college football? You know, I, mm-hmm. uh, 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 I always, I mean, uh, the, uh, Georgia had a, a number 99, uh, he was about 380 pounds and yet he moved, he moved so fast that he tackled <laughs> the running back. He, he literally went clear across, across the field and tackled the running back before the running back built, but uh, I mean the players that these guys have. So how do you know how to? And you know, listen, your conference, my conference, pretty pretty damn good conferences. Uh, right, as good as they get, you know, yeah. uh, as good as they get. But the, these teams are just so. So my question: uh, um, do, you, do you think the transfer portal and uh, uh, NIL, those little things, will help? even the playing field out down the road or do you like the nil and transfer portal i um i don't i think it all comes down to recruiting and i think that uh the sec just has they've just been so good for so long that the problem is is nick saban's coming out to california and he's getting all the best players because they all want to go to the best school in the country to play for the best coach and he's just established that and that has been going on for so long and I the last team that was really like super dominant was when Chip Kelly was at Oregon and he was getting all these amazing players and Oregon was like a national they were so dominant but now now that's not really happening anymore. I don't I don't know I mean it's I, I think I I'm a huge advocate for for image name and uh, likeness rights. And I think it's it's long overdue. And I'm very happy that they're finally doing it. I think I think in January, I think this month they actually are thinking of allowing the divisions, each division, division one, division two, and all the others to handle, to kind of um, each get divided and then handle it within it. So yeah, so I think, I think it could be a great opportunity for um, athletes just to be treated better. And I think you're right. I think um, instead of choosing based on uh, that, that could help with athletes sort of being attracted to sponsorships and that rather than just going to the best team in the country. But I also don't want it to turn into NFL where everything sort of becomes more about money and more about image and, and selling your brand. Because if it gets like that, uh, we might lose sort of the spirit of college football, which is why I like it. That's why I like it so much is it's, it's not like the NFL, you know, where everything sort of seems sometimes too thought out. So I, I don't know, but I, I really hope that, the SEC doesn't continue to dominate because it doesn't make it fun when, when one school is just always right. always goes to the championship. It's not fun. It's not fun. Uh, it's not fun. So uh, I just, I hold out hope. Uh, also, and, you know, it's funny. I go back when I was your age and way younger uh, because I was a basketball player too. You know, watching the old Boston Celtics uh, when they had Bill Russell. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and and they would six, seven, eight, ten championships out of twelve. And but what was amazing back then, of course, the salaries were minute. These are great, you know, Bill Russell and Bob Cousy and all these guys. And I'm not even looking at my Magic and Bird, even way before that. But there, there was a sense, and even with Magic and Bird, there was a sense of team. These mm-hmm. guys stayed, you know, uh, they stayed on the same team for a long, long, long time. It was a team. It was really, you're rooting for a team, and the team stayed together, and, and I like that. Uh, and, of course, Magic and Bird, you know, Magic stayed at L.A., and Bird was uh, at Boston. I, I watched uh, recently a documentary uh, on those two guys there, competition with each other. It was a great documentary. I was glued. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, moving along and kind of winding down, because uh, I, I could probably talk to you for a long time, but you do have classes, and I'm aware of that. So um, <laughs> uh, you did take um, a, a course at Yale University, the, the Science of Well-Being. What was that about? Because uh, I'd like to know. <laughs> yeah, no, I that was one of my the most favorite uh, courses that I've taken because uh, I am getting more into self-care and meditation. And the main thing I think she taught Professor Santos, um, a very good professor at Yale, was you can't always be, you know, perfect at everything. And I think especially kids always compare themselves to others. And that's where it just gets, you just you never feel satisfied because you always, there's always someone better. And so I think just focusing on yourself and just trying to get better each day as an individual and a person was the main thing and learning to not be perfect. You don't have to be perfect at everything. And life's not about being perfect. It's just about growing and being yourself. And uh, it connected a lot to the growth mindset, which started at Stanford, and just being able to, to realize that you're not fixed in a state. And if you fail once, it doesn't define you as a person, you just learn from it, and you grow, like, it's not that big of a deal. And your life is such a long, long time. So you can't really dwell on things like that. And, and never feel bad about not always, you know, winning, because it, it's not about that. It's just about growing at the end of the day. Would you say there should, there should be armies of your generation taking that course? Yes. Oh, 100%. 100%. It, it yeah. makes such a difference, especially now in a world that has changed forever. Right. You know, the world has changed in two years forever. And my takeaway is your generation will need more help. And I'm not talking about financial, but I'm talking about the well-being aspect, the mm-hmm. understanding and the well-being. So uh, the takeaway from listening to you about that is more people should take that. Um, um, you did something that just blows me away. You, you were involved with Habitat for Humanity and you spent... Uh, Two weeks in India. Uh, your takeaway from that? I mean, that's a wow. I've always wanted to go to India. I just never did. But wow. Yeah, it that was one of the most moving experiences I've ever had. I went. It was the summer after my junior year in high school, and I spent a year studying India. Um, so I read uh, the book about Gandhi and I watched um, we watched Gandhi the movie and we studied the religion in India and things like that and then I got to go there and it's so different than the U.S. um, just everything about it and the problems we have here are way different than the problems they have there and I think it just puts everything sort of into perspective for you that I I knew I had it good, like I've had an amazing life, but going to such impoverished places and going to orphanages and going to slums and schools in India and realizing how they live there and how different it is, um, it just it just put my life into perspective and how 
how many blessings I have and living in California and going to an amazing college and having all these opportunities, I can't, you know, I can't take it for granted. And I, I seeing, seeing that and helping over there with Habitat for Humanity, it was uh, an amazing experience. It also taught me, made me realize that I want to do social entrepreneurship in my life, maybe not as a, as a, my full-time career, but I know I always want to uh, help people who are less fortunate than me because I feel a need to give back and I feel, um, I feel a need to help those who, who need the help. So that's a reason why uh, I started a nonprofit with my, one of my best friends uh, last year, um, giving food to the homeless here in my, in my hometown. And uh, yeah, so I, it was very eye-opening and I would love to go back. I really would. Um, uh, we had no electronics for two weeks, wow. which is, which is amazing. Wow. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I would love to do that again. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Uh, I, I interviewed, I've interviewed uh, a number uh, of young people from India who moved here and mm -hmm. getting their, their, um, their, history and, and why they came to America and what they've accomplished here. Uh, um, and I always marvel at, at India on a spiritual level and, mm -hmm. and the fact that uh, in 20 years, it'll be the, the biggest country on the planet. Another 20 years, I'll pass China by, but it's a democracy. And, mm -hmm. and I, I kind of like that. So finally, my last question to you, um, and I'm going to send you off to class. Um, my, my last question, you, you've got, you're a young guy and you've got this co uh, commitment to, to mental health. How and where did that come from and, um, and how does that influence you and in, in direction on you? Yeah, so in my family, mental health issues are uh, a big thing. Um, on my mom's side, her, her, her brothers have dealt with bipolar disorder and it's sort of run down so um yeah I mean it's something that's always been on my mind and I see it and I know that it's very important um to talk about and so I've it's always been a mission of mine to to desensitize that stigma that we always have around mental health because <laughs> we need to talk about it and I think everyone has problems of their own and so I, I think it's important in any, any way I can help the situation, I try to. So when I was a senator, I helped institute wellness days, which were supposed to help students going through a hard time, you know, with Zoom to have a day off where it was just a, a day of the week where you had no class and we would just say, okay, you're off. Um, so that was one of the That's things cool. I did. But yeah, so yeah, I just think, I think there's people go through things, a lot of things, and they're afraid to, to speak about it. And I think it's really important to not be afraid to speak about it and to just accept who you are and, and who other people are and don't, you know, judge people because you never know what someone's going through. And uh, I think it's so important to, uh, to talk, just have important conversations, critical conversations that need to be had. Well put, and and the whole in, the whole institution of mental health mm -hmm. had, had gotten such a boost from Simone Biles. And, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, this maybe the, the the greatest gymnast of all times had issues, and mm -hmm. nobody understood him, and so she brought it to she brought it to forefront. Great stuff. Jack, um, this has been great. I mean, really great stuff. Um, we theoretically could have gone on for a lot longer, but yeah, uh, we, we, uh, we came, we accomplished. This was great. I, I, I can't thank you enough. I, I marvel uh, at the connectivity of the universe and we found each other on social media and, and that just worked out great. Uh, and um, please do come back when the book is done and ready and we'll talk about that uh and you know go usc and uh <laughs> go rutgers uh and and to be continued jack 